Hi, I'm Beverly Banner Brown. Today on Narcissistic Relationships slash Codependency Revealed, we have part six of the Repetition Compulsion series that I've been working on, making new videos with you, uh, for you, I should say. This is one of the most uh, potent of all the topics, and really, in some ways, the most difficult to understand for many people who've never been in really abusive situations, but for the ones of you who have, it may strike an uncomfortably familiar note. So let me say all of this as gently and as lovingly and of course as always as, as respectfully as I can. First of all, the subtitle of this one is The Familiarity of Contempt. Narcissistic Relationships, uh, part one of the Repetition Compulsion series, I was guided to call The Familiarity of Chaos. This one is The Familiarity of Contempt. What is contempt? And first, let's review what is Repetition Compulsion. Repetition compulsion was a term that was given to a condition which so many millions and millions of people have suffered with for so many thousands of years really and never knew necessarily what it was and never knew necessarily how to deal with it. And frankly, I think it's highly uh, likelier that you'll get better from it and be freed of it if you do deal with a skilled professional person who has years of experience doing that clearing work in a gentle and loving, graceful way. Sigmund Freud was talking, I believe, about a situation where the brain gets wired, the ideas, the core ideas and beliefs, the old BS that I've referred to so many times before, the old belief system, gets a negative message about what it is to be alive, what it is to be on this planet, what it is to love and be loved, feelings of unworthiness, feelings of uh, not enoughness, not being good enough, not being pretty enough, smart enough, wise enough. And those beliefs get acted out, sometimes through self-fulfilling prophecies, sometimes through self-sabotaging actions that occur as a kind of knee-jerk response when there are certain triggers. So, today we're going to be talking about the familiarity of contempt. I thought perhaps a uh, sample, an example from people I've known in the past might be helpful. As an intuitive, as a life and relationship coach, as a love mentor, as a dating coach, this is an issue that often comes up when people come to me and they are in these situations where people are treating them with contempt. So let's review how I'm using the word contempt because, like so many other words, the meaning, the connotations can sometimes be subtle. And I want to be really giving you clarity about this. Contempt is something that is bordering on hatred, I would say. It's a distinct lack of respect. It's somebody demeaning you, somebody putting you down, somebody oppressing you, somebody intimidating you, somebody who's basically communicating a message that they consider you to be barely human and not worth their time, their effort, their attention, their love, their affection, their money, their integrity. And so they'll lie to you, and they'll exaggerate situations, and they'll fail to keep promises, and they generally just tend to treat you in a way that is so totally absent of any kind of decency and respect that if it is triggering repetition compulsion, you feel consciously like getting away from them, yet very often you stay and you try harder and harder to win their love, win their approval, win their fidelity, win their time, their quality time, their touch, their lovemaking, 
uh, their commitment to a future with you, even though you know consciously that if somebody described the situation to you in the detail that, I, that uh, you're experiencing, you would advise them to go get professional help in order to get strong and do whatever they had to do to extricate themselves quickly from that person or that situation. It's a feeling of being stuck. It's very oppressive. It's part of the old BS, the old belief system that unconsciously moves you in a direction that you do not want to be in and which causes you oftentimes to lose self-esteem, lose integrity, and feel generally awful about yourself and about your future and about your prospects. So. Let me give you an example, as I had promised to do earlier. I've known people who have been the last in the family to be born, the baby. In one case that I'm remembering, there were many female children born to a mother and a father. The father was a guy who was extraordinarily macho. He'd been a boxer, he'd been a football player, he'd been very, very big uh, as an athlete all through his high school years into his 20s, and he really, he wanted a son. Now, he managed to do okay with his daughters. He pushed them in very athletic pursuits, and some of them uh, acquiesce. Some of them actually had inherited his uh, gift for a live, agile body, for speed, for endurance, and they complied. The ones who didn't were not respected. The ones who were more intellectually geared, who loved book learning, who uh, were good at literature or uh, any number of other pursuits, they did not impress him at all. And then the last one, the baby, was born. And he said to his wife, if this one's a girl, because I've got to have my boy, she's all yours. I wipe my hands of the whole situation. And in fact, they did get another little girl. A beautiful, wonderful, amazing, remarkable, creative, visionary, fantastic female child. The mother loved her dearly as she had loved, to the best of her ability, all of the children, living always under the unfortunate dark cloud of her husband, who had a drinking problem, whose consciousness, as you would gather from what I've told you so far, was not exactly <laughs> the most open-minded, the most gener generously spirited, but she managed. And she worked hard at it, apparently. The little girl, the baby I'm describing, grew up with absolute contempt, contemptuous treatment by her father. He made it clear from day one he wasn't going to hold her, he wasn't going to take care of her, he was not going to feed her. He would let her stay in the house because he didn't feel he had any choice, but he resented her. And he insisted on giving her a name that was suitable for a boy. So the message was communicated clearly, disrespectfully. He robbed himself not only of the love and the attention and the affection that he could have received, the mutual bonding, the mutual joy that they could have had. It's so sad, isn't it? And I tell you the story, sometimes I, I have to really check myself from crying because it is, it is so poignant to me that this can happen between human beings. But this did, this did go on and it gave her a very, very unfortunate message and it gave her a repetition compulsion kind of wiring in the brain that what she deserved from a man was disrespect, was uh, demeaning behavior, was abusiveness. He was often insulting to her, often verbally uh, very disrespectful. If she did any infraction of the rules in the house, 
She got slapped, she got hit, she got pushed. She was living in a constant state, really, of intimidation. And finally, when she got to be in her mid to late teens, she could no longer tolerate it. And she basically told her mother, even though I love you dearly, I'm out of here. You know, when kids leave around 15 or 16, it's generally a pretty very very often a very potent sign that something extraordinarily painful and dysfunctional was going on in a household, whether it was incest, covert incest, one kind of an abuse or another. And she made it on her own and she got involved with all sorts of people and was very promiscuous for a period of time, went from one guy to another, and all of them wound up the same way. They all wound up to be drinkers, whether they started out that way or not, in the beginning, because, well, they lured her in, very typical. And while she was pursuing some of her educational goals and some of her professional interests very successfully, she was having a terrible time in each of these relationships because they would always deteriorate after a reasonably decent start into disrespect, devaluing of her, and contempt. So she was dealing then with the familiarity of contempt. The repetition compulsion was to do anything and everything to make it okay to gain this young man's love. But again, as in the other cases with repetition compulsion, whoever it was who was in front of her, whoever it was who was her bed partner or her home mate, he was just a stand-in for the father's love that she could never get. Do you see the power of recognizing this if it affects your life or someone close to you? Do you understand that once we make these things conscious, we can change them? We can literally, I know methods of doing this, I've done it in my own life, I've done it with clients where I got to be having the sacred great privilege and joy of shepherding them through a reparenting process, a healing process, that changed literally the ideas, the rewiring of the brain, the fundamental belief system to one where never again will anybody treat them in that kind of way. They won't attract somebody like that. Or if they do, because sometimes we do attract somebody like that once or twice again just to see, have we really gotten the message? Are we really seeing the red flags or are we wearing the old rose-colored glasses once again and need to remove them? Very human, very tempting, very familiar. You can have better than that. That's the great news that I've come once again to share with you it gives me enormous joy to pre prepare these for you. I would suggest strongly you get professional help in trying to deal with this and all the other uh, series that I've done on repetition compulsion. This is part six, and there may be more, because as I go along in making these videos for you, new ideas come. You send me wonderful, amazingly insightful questions very often that I really can't go into in any depth on the commentaries on YouTube because they're too personal. However, they do spark ideas for new videos. And I encourage you to send those. Just please, because I'm getting such a volume now, more and more as the channel becomes more and more known and more popular, uh, it takes me a while sometimes to answer them. But answer them I do to the best of my ability because I love to know what you're thinking, what you're feeling. I love that we're making this community. Please, if you haven't already, join. Press that little red button and subscribe free of charge and become part of this growing, loving, mutually concerned, mutually caring YouTube community. Until next time, I'm Beverly Bano Brown, wishing you every joy, every happiness, and the knowledge that the best is just good enough for you and the best is yet to come.